All right, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings, chapter 19. 1 Kings, chapter 19. Enjoy putting together the newsletter. A lot of fun just to sit and talk and Josh and laugh and uh, enjoy that fellowship. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody's there, 1 Kings chapter 19. And uh, start at verse 1. It says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. When he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there, that he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, where he, had request, where he requested for himself that he, must, that he might die, and said, it is, enough, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. May God have blessing to the reading of his word, and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you, Lord, for the privilege that you have given us to be in your house once again tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the singing, thank you for the testimony, we thank you for the time of fellowship. Lord, we pray you'd help us now, Lord, as it's time to preach. Lord, we just need your help and we need your guidance. I pray, God, you'd order our thoughts and give us the words that are needful for this hour. Heavenly Father, that you would uh, just use us as, as your mouthpiece this evening. Heavenly Father, we'll give you the praise and the glory for all that might be accomplished tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And uh, verse 4 there says, But he himself went a day's journey, talking about Elijah, into the wilderness, he came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested, him, he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. You know, this passage of Scripture here has always been uh, kind of intriguing to me. You know, think about what had just occurred in chapter 18, uh, and how Elijah had challenged Baal's prophets, and uh, you know, the great fire that came down out of heaven and uh, took the, licked up uh, Elijah's sacrifice, the, the stones, the sacrifice, the water, the dust, it says. You know, he had mocked the, the, the prophets of Baal as they prayed and prayed and prayed and cut themselves and tried to get the uh, get their God, Baal, to answer by fire. And Elijah had challenged him. He said, let the God that answers by fire be uh, the true God. Uh, and after he had challenged them and they failed to have, have the fire fall, you know, Elijah, he said, let's make it a little more interesting, dig a trench around that thing, bring some barrels of water and pour over it. You know, I, I think he wanted to make sure that they couldn't even say that there was even a, a, an ember under there somewhere from uh, their false god. Uh, you know, uh, he just covered her up with water, and, and when he prayed, I don't think it took, uh, you know, a minute of prayer, I think that God heard him as soon as he said, God, you know, answer by fire, and he took it up, and then here, he slew the prophets of Baal, and you turn over to the next chapter here, just, you know, basically the same day, within a day, and uh, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he had slain all the prophets of, with the sword, then Jezebel went and sent a messenger unto Elijah and said, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if if I make not thy life as one of the one of them by tomorrow about this time, you know what do you think Elijah had to be afraid of? You know, think think about what had just happened. Is his memory that short? I just wonder. You know, you know sometimes I think we're like that. We we forget the goodness that God does and how okay. you know what He does in our life and how He answers prayers and God had just you know wrought a great victory there really and and uh, showing that He's the true God. And then Jezebel comes and says, "I'm going to kill you." Is basically what she was saying to Elijah. Tomorrow about this time, you'll be dead just like those prophets. Uh, and Elijah, what do he do? He ran. Uh, and uh, he went into the wilderness there, and he, he told God, he said, just let me die. You know, uh, uh, it's enough. Uh, take away my life. I'm not better than my father's. You know, he, what happened? All of a sudden, he got discouraged. It seems like we're on a mountaintop, 
one minute, and then the, the next, the very next minute, we're, we're in the valley. And I think that's where Elijah was. And he's to the point he was discouraged. He said, you know, just, just Lord, just take me home. You know, let me die. Uh, so what causes that? Why do we get discouraged in our Christian walk? Uh, and that's that's what I want to want to ask uh, and try to answer here tonight. Why why do we get discouraged? And another place in, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10, it says, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Uh, you know, he felt like he was standing all alone, and God later tells him, you're not alone. Uh, you know, I've got uh, several thousand that haven't bowed their knee to, uh, to the idols, and you're not alone. Uh, but we forget uh, first point we forget the greatness of our God the psalmist said in Psalm 105 verses 4 and 5 says seek the Lord in his strength seek his face evermore remember his marvelous works that he hath done his wonders and the judgments of his mouth we get discouraged we get overwhelmed at the greatness of our task or the situation that we're in and uh, we fail to remember the greatness of our God uh, I, I, I like uh, what the psalmist said there it says, uh, remember his marvelous work that he hath done, his wonders and his judgments and the judgments of his mouth. You know, sometimes we just got to stop and remember who we serve. Remember the greatness of our God. Remember, hey, we're serving the God of heaven. We're serving the God who's spoken into existence. We're serving the God who loved us enough to send his son Jesus to die for us on the cross of Calvary. We're precious in his sight. Uh, God loves us, and we sit back so many times when we have pity parties and say, nobody cares for me. And that's, you know, Elijah was discouraged, and he was downhearted for, for whatever reason he got thinking in himself that, you know, he was the only one left, and, and he wasn't. And we sometimes we do the very same thing. God, nobody else is doing anything. Nobody cares. Nobody knows what situation I'm in. Nobody knows what I'm going through, and we just want to have a little pity party. But we need to remember who we serve. We need to remember who our God is. Remember his marvelous works. And that same God is our God. Uh, and we need to understand that. And we ought to be praising him for that. The psalmist said in Psalm 8 verses 3 and 4. It says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? You know, when we look around and we see uh, the vastness of our universe. And I was reading an article the other day. They were talking about. Uh, you know, the scientists are in a great debate that, that there might not be trillions of universes out there. There just might just be billions of universes out there. Uh, you know, uh, so they, they backed off their numbers a little bit. You know, regardless of what is out there, my God created that. My God created the vastness of the universe that you see. Uh, he's my God. He loves me. You know, he everything that is out there, he hung the sun and the moon and the stars. He put everything in play. Uh, and that's the God that loves me, and that's the greatness of my God. That's the God that cares for me, and he knows what we're going through. You know, when in our eyes our situation looks hopeless, the situation for God's not hopeless. You know, so many times we look at things and say, man, that, you know, I just don't know what I'm going to do. You know what? God knows what he's going to do, yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, and we might not know what we're going to do, but God knows what he's going to do. You know, I think of Israel at the Red Sea. You know, the Egyptian army is bearing down on them, and uh, people's murmuring against Moses and said, we're going to die here. And uh, God opens up the Red Sea and they walk across on dry land. You know, God knew what he was going to do. Uh, God knew, God was showing his greatness. You know, when the, when the king of Syria surrounded Elisha and his servant in Dothan, uh, and his servant looked and said, Alas, master, what are we going to do? There's uh, so many around us. And he was afraid. And the Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 6, Verse 16 says, And he answered and said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And maybe I think that uh, Elijah's servant turned around and said, What do you mean? Look at that great army that's out there that's surrounded us. What do you mean there's more with us than there is with them? And the Bible says in verse 17 of, of 2 Kings chapter 6, it says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and of fire round about Elisha. Uh, you know, Elisha's servant couldn't see that. Elisha, uh, but Elisha wasn't worried. Elisha said, hey, what are you worried about? There's more with us than there is with them. Uh, and he, he had to pray and ask 
that his servant's eyes be open so that he could see that. Uh, you know, God, our God is a great God. And he knows what we're going through. He knows the trial that we're in. He knows the situation that we're in. And he's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. He's going to be with us in the midst of that. Uh, don't forget the greatness of our God. Uh, he's able to deliver us. And if he doesn't deliver us from it, he's going to bring us through it. You know, I, that's what I like about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, you know, they didn't bow before the king. And their answer to the king was, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, uh, be it known unto thee that we did not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. You know, they said God is able, but you know, whatever his will is, is what they surrendered to uh, in that situation. And God didn't save him from the fire, but he went with him in the fire. So no matter what we're going through, remember that hey, we serve a God who can, and he's going to be with us whether we go through the fire or whether he saves us out of the fire. God is going to be with us. He's, that's the greatness of our God. Don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Don't quit. But keep on keeping on for the Lord. That's what, you know, So one reason that we get discouraged is because we forget the greatness of our God. Don't forget the greatness of our God. Amen. Another thing that we get, the reason we get discouraged is uh, we forget what we're taught in the Word of God. In, in James chapter 1, verses 23 and 24 says, for, <clears throat> for if any be a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like, his un, like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way straightway, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. You know, we, uh, if we don't stay plugged in to something, we forget. You know, we, we uh, lose our edge, so to speak. We were joking with Josiah down there. Uh, when we were putting together the newsletter, whether or not he was uh, still good at basketball, uh, you know, uh, he, he's probably pretty good. He probably he might be able to beat me, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I figure he probably has lost his edge a little bit since he was actually playing and practicing every day. He doesn't practice every day like he used to. Uh, you know, we do the same thing in our Christian walk when we when we quit reading our Bible and we quit praying, we get quit coming to church. You know, that's that's where we're at now. A lot of folks quit coming to church because of COVID. Uh, we get out of practice, so to speak, and we forget. Uh, we forget about the greatness of our God. We forget about what we've been taught uh, in the Bible and what God has shown us in the Bible. Uh, you know, if we don't stay uh, practiced up on it, you know, stay studied up on it, and, and stay in the game, so to speak, we're going to lose our edge. We don't want that. Uh, we need to keep on keeping on for him and not give up, not quit. <clears throat> we, we know whatever we learn, we, we need to try to remember and just keep repeating that task. And sometimes people say, well, I've read the Bible before. We'll read it again. Uh, you know, Philippians 3, 1 says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. You know, Paul was telling us, and I, you know, I know I'm writing the same thing that you've heard before. It's not, it's not grievous to me to do that. It's safe for you to hear it. Uh, you know, to repetition. Mm -hmm. Repetition puts things in our mind. You know, people will say, I've read the Bible. Read it again. People say, the preacher's preached on that before. Good, remember it. Listen again. Uh, you know, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them. Uh, Peter says, hey, I know you know these things, but let me remind you of it again. You know, we read the Bible and say, yeah, I know that. But hey, when we read it and get that repetition and we read it again and, and see another situation, it reminds us. It bring, you know, it, it helps us to continue to remember who God is and that he's able. and He's going he's to meet our needs. Uh, he says, wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in, this, in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting, putting you in remembrance. You know, when the preacher gets up and preaches, maybe a lot of times you know what he's preaching about, but what he's doing is re he's bringing things to remembrance. Uh, and I, I, I got to tell you, I can't remember even what preacher it was I was listening to one time. He said one time he was, he was preaching somewhere, and afterwards somebody came up to him and said, Preacher, he said, you said turn to this uh, scripture, and he said, I was looking on the other page, and in my Bible, and this scripture really spoke to me. And he said, what wasn't even what I was preaching on. He said, but I left, and I thought, 
Well, praise God, at least I had the right page. <laughs> you know, uh, he was, he said, you know, God can use little things to get us in the right place. Uh, but, you know, keep putting things in your remembrance by reading his word and studying it. The more we study something and do it, the more to become a part of who we are, uh, you know, practice and rehearse, you know, just remember those things. Put them in your heart. Uh, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Uh, if we'll do that, then we won't get discouraged so easily. Uh, if we don't, we're apt, well, we're apt to get discouraged. Uh, another reason that we're apt to get discouraged is because we don't consider who we are, whose we are, who we belong to. Isaiah 1.3 says, The ox knoweth his master, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Uh, you know, Isaiah was saying, you know, the animals know who their master is. Our dog knows uh, that, that she belongs to us. Uh, you know, she comes to our house for the food and the shelter, and she knows about that. And, and mm -hmm. sometimes even uh, my parents' dog comes up and in, you know. Uh, but the dogs know uh, who they belong to. And you and I need to realize that, hey, just like we take care of our animals and they who know, know who their master is, you and I need to remember who our master is. And God's going to take care of us. Uh, don't forget whose we are, who we belong to. We belong to God. We're his. We're a purchased possession. God cares for us. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, it says, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? And you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We belong to him. He purchased us. Uh, you know, we're his. Uh, as Christians, we've been adopted into his family. Sometimes we forget whose we are. <clears throat> you think about it. Think about your own children, if you've got children. Uh, you know, what would you do for them to try to take care of them? You know, a good parent's going to do about anything they can whatever it takes to take care of their kids. You know what? God's the same way. We're his children. He loves us. And when we forget whose we are, we might get discouraged. But when we remember who we are, whose we are, that ought to encourage us. Hey, I'm, I'm a child of God. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I belong to him. Jesus died for me. I, I'm one of his. You know, that right there ought to be something that encourages us as Christians, that we're his children. Now Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7 says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his Spirit, the Spirit of his Son, into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through, Christ, through, through Jesus Christ, or through Christ. So, you know, we're his heirs. We belong to him. We're not, not a servant, but we're a son. We've been adopted into his family. Uh, you know, just think about that a little bit. Why should we be discouraged? You know, we belong to him. We're his children. Uh, and he's going to take care of us. Uh, Luke eleven thirteen says, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? You know, we know to give good gifts to our children. And God's going to take care of us. We're his children. So uh, don't forget who you are, who you belong to. When you, if you do forget who you belong to, then you might get discouraged. Uh, another way that we get discouraged is when we begin to yield to the appeal of the world, and yield to the, the fleshly desires of the world. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And we live in a world that we're not, this, this world's not our home. You know, we get, we, we tend to get attached to it, uh, you know, but everything here is temporary. Amen. Everything here is temporary. Uh, you know, it's, it's not going to last. It's not going to be here forever. Now, you might live to be a hundred years old, but it's still temporary. Uh, and don't get attached to this world. Uh, there's nothing here for you and I. You know, remember that. Remember that we belong to Him. Don't love the things of the world. We live in a world that's not our home. Uh, we're just passing through. 
So we need to strive to keep our flesh and our worldly desires under control. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, Paul said, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And I don't think Paul was talking about being lost. I think he was talking about ruining his testimony. You know, every Christian has a testimony for the Lord. Now, some have a better testimony than others, and some have ruined their testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, they really have no testimony before a lost and dying world because of the things that they've gotten into. doesn't mean that they're lost. It just means that they, they, they don't have a testimony. They're saved, but they don't have any influence on the, on the people of the world because people look at them, just like Lot. You know, Lot had lost his testimony when he lived there in Sodom. When he went to his son-in-laws and his daughters, uh, that weren't in his house, and he began to tell them the judgment was coming. They looked at him as one that mocked, is what the Bible said. He didn't have a testimony to him, and he had let you know, his testimony be hurt uh, by the things of the world that he was surrounded with. When we start letting the things of the world affect us, it'll discourage us in our Christian walk. It'll get us down, and it'll, it'll keep us from being what God wants us to be for him. So, you know, don't yield to the fleshly desires don't yield to the appeal of the world you know separate god said come out from among them and be ye separate saith the lord god wants us to be separate i, I believe that he we're different we're his right. children we need to understand that so when we get out of fellowship with god god chases us we need to get back in fellowship say god forgive me and help me to uh, to live the way that you want me to live otherwise we'll, we'll get discouraged and I think uh, another reason why we get discouraged sometimes is because we lack diligence. And uh, I like that word diligent. I've, I've, I've given you the definition so many times, you ought to know, and it's careful, steady effort. You know, are we diligent in our efforts to serve the Lord? Are we diligent in our Bible study? Uh, you know, careful, steady effort. Are we diligent in our prayer life? Are we diligent in our church attendance? Uh, are we diligent in our witnessing? You know, Careful, steady effort. You know, if you want to be a witness for the Lord, you got to put forth an effort. You know, you, you've got to make an effort to open your mouth and be a witness to people. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. When God speaks to you and says, hey, uh, talk to that person, we got to be willing to say, okay, Lord, you said talk to him. I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to try to talk to him. I'm going to tell him about Jesus. Uh, but we got to be diligent about it. We can't just say, well, I don't really have time today. Uh, you know, I don't want to really want to get into that conversation. There's too many people around. We can come up with a thousand and one excuses if we're not diligent. But we need to be diligent. You know, maybe maybe it's our Bible time, our, our Bible reading time. Lord, I'm, I'm running late today. I don't, I don't have time to read my Bible. Or I'm running late today. I don't have time to pray. Uh, if we are not diligent in our effort to, to stay in the right relationship with the Lord, we're going to get discouraged. So be diligent. We, if, if we're diligent, I think that, that our relationship with God will stay in, in, in the right place. So uh, as Christians, we have a lot to be encouraged about. Uh, Joshua 1, 9 says, have, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. God is with us wherever we're at. I, I don't care where you're at, I don't care what situation you're in, I don't care what problem you're facing god is with you as a christian uh, and he's going to be with you he's going to help you he's going to bring us through that whatever it might be uh you know what a blessing to know that god's going to be with us hebrews 13 5 says let your conversation be without covetous and be content with such things as you have for he has said i will never leave thee nor forsake thee god will encourage us and he'll strengthen us he'll give us what we need uh to make it through whatever situation it is. Wait on the Lord, uh, you know, trust him, and he'll give us what we need. The psalmist said in Psalm 27, 14, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, that's a hard thing to do sometimes because we, we ask God and we want an immediate answer. You know, sometimes God doesn't answer immediately. You know, we live in a, we live in a microwave society. If you want popcorn... Hey, all you gotta do is go in there and grab that little bag, throw it in the microwave, put two minutes on the popcorn on the microwave, and in two minutes you'll have popcorn. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes that's not the way it works with God. 
You know, we talk to God and we pray about something. We expect uh, a two-minute answer. You know, and, and God's not ready to answer like that. We got to wait on Him. We got to pray and we got to remain faithful and say, God, I'm trusting you. Give me an answer and trust Him for it. And He says, Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Be patient with Him. He'll give us what we need when we need it. Let's get a song of invitation. If you're here tonight and you have a need, this altar is open. We want to encourage you to come. If, uh, if you're a Christian, you just need to talk to him. Hey, don't be afraid to come and talk to the Lord. Uh, the altar is a good place to do business. If you're lost, you need to be saved.